I mentioned that there are also two big oversights in the household wealth report. And the first is that the Fed mysteriously does not include the general liabilities of the government when calculating household net wealth. Wouldn't it make sense for the Fed to offset fees against household wealth? After all, who else besides the taxpayers living in households are going to pay off those liabilities? Nobody. That's who. If the Fed did perform this offset, household net worth would plunge below zero. So I can guess why this comparison is never made. The second oversight is that the data is presented as if it applied to our entire country in a fairly even and useful manner. It does not. The top 1% owns 35% of all net household wealth and, looking at stocks only, owns 56% of all stock by value. If you can't see it, I apologize. The top 1% is represented by a very thin red smear at the top of that column there. It's great that our stock market keeps powering higher, but for every trillion dollars it goes up, 560 billion of that goes to only one out of 100 households. The top 20%, which includes the top 1%, owns 85% of all household net wealth and 80% of all stocks by value. This means that the bottom 80% of the citizens of this country, represented in yellow, holds only 15% of the total wealth of this country. Remember, an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. More immediately, this tells us that our credit crisis is going to be worse than advertised, just as was true of the wealth gap in the late 1920s before the onset of the Great Depression. The severity of the crisis will not depend on average wealth, but on the distribution of the wealth. If a large swath of the population lacks the means to weather the storm, then that storm will be longer and harsher than otherwise would be the case. So what does it mean that 80% of our population possesses a meager 15% of the total wealth? For one thing, it means that recent efforts by the Fed to provide massive amounts of liquidity to support the biggest and wealthiest banks at the inflationary expense of the lower classes were not only misguided, but they were cruel and unusual. This leads to an easy prediction to make. The wealth gap in the United States will hamper our recovery and deepen the downturn. In order to really understand why I have been harping on this notion of assets being variable and their value being dependent on the ratio of buyers to sellers, we'll need to take a quick trip into demographics. Recall that the U.S. government has not saved in any of its entitlement programs and that it has a massive shortfall in them, measuring the tens of trillions of dollars. That situation comes about because the entitlement programs are really wealth transfer programs, not savings accounts, and so they depend on a significant surplus of current workers to retirees. The shortfalls in these programs are being exacerbated by a troubling trend. In 1950, there were seven workers per retiree, and the system was balanced. By 2005, that ratio had dropped to only five to one and the system was already exhibiting signs of distress. By 2030, that ratio will have plummeted to a thoroughly unworkable value of less than 3 to 1. And this trend comes about as a feature of the so-called baby boom. This is a demographic chart of the United States, and each bar represents a clustering of all the people who are within a five-year wide age window, as seen on the left axis. The baby boomers number around 75 million strong and roughly occupy these four bands. While it may not seem like much, the hole that exists in the population behind the baby boomers represents an enormous challenge and even threat to our entitlement programs and will greatly complicate our efforts to resolve our levels of debt and our national failure to save. A more normal population distribution, if you will, and the kind that humans evolved with over countless millennia looks like this a pyramid. Again, this shows five-year-wide age brackets with men in red and women in yellow. This distribution is capable of supporting an entitlement program such as the one in the U.S. that is based on transferring wealth directly from workers to retirees. But when we cast this chart forward to 2000, the baby boomer bulge is quite apparent. Besides the challenge that this demographic profile offers to the entitlement programs, an even larger challenge is presented to both the debt and savings issues I painted in previous chapters, and even to the value of our assets. Here's what I mean. The boomers are the wealthiest generation ever. They hold nearly all of the assets, 
and they will need to dispose of those assets to fund their retirements. Who exactly are the boomers planning on selling their assets to? This guy? Even if his generation somehow could afford to buy all these assets, there simply aren't enough people in his generation to buy them. In order to fund their retirement dreams, boomers are going to have to sell off their assets. And again, we might wonder, to whom exactly? And lastly, if the massive accumulation of debt over the past 23 years was predicated on the assumption that the future will be much larger than the present, we might also question how exactly that will come to pass if boomers are retiring en masse and there are fewer behind them to take their place. Man, the next generation better be prepared to work really, really hard. Too bad they're graduating with the highest levels of college debt ever recorded. This sort of demographic profile will be with us for decades and cannot be wished away or fixed by some clever policy. It is simply a fact of life, and one that we do well to recognize and plan for rather than ignore. Boomer retirement has already begun, and the pace of this will accelerate rapidly over the next 15 years, which will make the 20 teens quite interesting, and leads me to conclude that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. Next time, we're going to discuss asset bubbles. Understanding the destructive dynamics of bubbles is critical if you want to know what's coming next and why the Federal Reserve is panicking right now.